Hello, everyone. Welcome to our special event today, the Presidential Cycle, A Technical Perspective. We're super fortunate to have three incredible experts, really particularly with the presidential cycle. When we talked about the idea of the election season and how we wanted to address it on Stock Charts TV, I sort of had a wish list of three people to approach. We're super excited to tell you all three of them were very interested in the idea and accepted gladly and uh, agreed to participate. So to be honest with you, you know, as we think about the presidential cycle, as we think about year end and all the different potential headwinds and tailwinds to the market environment, we also have this thing running in the background, which is the traditional four year cycle or the presidential cycle, which is the, you know, the, the uh, pattern that has tended to evolve in the markets for decades. And what we're going to do over the course of the next 45 minutes or so is have these three experts share with us their experiences with this presidential cycle, what it means to them, how they use it. And then we'll get to some particular ideas what that should mean for you and your portfolio right about now. I want to welcome on my three guests. We have, and again, I'm super excited that all three of them are uh, participating today. And I should say that every one of you guys um, deserve your own 45-minute discussion, if not much more. So I, I think we have a lot of horsepower here. We have Tom McClellan, editor of the uh, McClellan Market Report. Uh, we have Bruce Frazier, professor and white coffee and wizard, an editor of uh, or uh, host of Power Charting on Stock Charts TV. And we have Jeff Hirsch, editor-in-chief of the Stock Traders Almanac, chief market strategist at the Probabilities Fund. Gentlemen, thank you so, so much for joining us on the show today. Great to be with you. Thanks for Thank putting you. us together. So, you know, as we think about the presidential cycle, again, I'm really excited to, to talk with each one of you. Tom McClellan, we're going to start with you, uh, you know, because I think as we were speaking ahead of time, you did such a great job of laying out what the cycle means and how you actually created it. So we're going to start with your graphic. I'd love for you just to, to talk us through how the presidential cycle is constructed and, uh, and, and, and walk us through your line of thinking. Well, it's long been known that there's a, a relationship between how the market behaves and the four-year presidential cycle in the United States. Mm -hmm. So to try to capture that, what I did is I took the S&P 500 data and chopped it up into four-year segments, uh, which you can see on the chart there. I call that my Rapunzel chart because it's kind of <laughs> scattered everywhere. But if you then take all those data points and average them together, you get what's known as the presidential cycle pattern. And it starts out at a value of one, and then it goes up generally. And what you can, and, and the way that I do it is different than some people. I start it as of November first, because the election's in November, and the stock market usually starts reacting to how the election turns out, uh, as opposed to waiting for inauguration day. The first two years, you can see, are generally choppy sideways. Uh, the third year is nearly always an up year. Uh, only in rare circumstances is it not an up year like 1939 when Hitler was marching through Poland, for example. The fourth year is also generally an up year, but of a slightly lesser slope because people are starting to worry about the next election and their, and their outcome and what that, what's that going to mean, and, the, and there's an unknown, and so they feel a little bit less confident. But that's gen generally the pattern of how it goes. Uh, now, this is the average pattern, so half the time the market does better, half the time the market does worse. This is just the average of... Uh, which allows us to see what the, the general tendency is. In the current time frame, in the current four-year presidential term that we're in now, we can see that the it, that's the, the blue line on my chart is the S&P 500 now, and it's done a lot better than average, uh, and it started doing better than average right from the beginning. Um, not all of the parts of the market's behavior, uh, especially during the first two years of Trump's term, uh, fit the pattern very well. And we can explain that away as saying, well, Trump's a different kind of president. But starting in the third year, the, the pattern correlation got locked in much more tightly, uh, mm -hmm. except for the COVID crash, which was a big interruption. But since then, it's gotten back on track. And, and you see even the minor wiggles in the, in the presidential cycle pattern, they get e echoed with this, what the S&P 500 does. If we go to the uh, zoom in on just the most recent activity, you can see that nice tight correlation, a uh, little bit of lead and lag. The, the, the presidential cycle pattern said there was supposed to be a top September 3rd. It came in September 2nd. That will allow for a little bit of deviation. <laughs> but generally speaking, the market has been acting very much like it usually acts during this election year. Uh, the rest of this uh, of the pattern, as it runs out to the next November 1st, says uh, we go chopping sideways as we have everybody worried and waiting for what the outcome is going to be, uh, and then they don't know. Once we get the outcome, then people can start acting more confidently and start looking at other types of news and, and, and how that shapes their thinking on their investments. 
One thing that's important to know, though, is that the stock market on average behaves differently if you have a first-term president versus if you have a, a, an incumbent who gets reelected, or you have a president for, uh, who's from the same party as the predecessor, such as Truman following uh, FDR. And so, generally speaking, the first two years are worse if you get a first-term president from a new party than a different party than the last one. And that's typically because when you get a new president coming into office it's the, from a different party, the, the new president will typically spend the first two years declaring that, oh my gosh, things are even worse than I told you before, and oh, <laughs> there's all these problems, and it's a huge problem, and, and we've got to pass my legislation to solve it. Generally speaking, investors don't tend to like hearing that things are worse than they thought, and uh, so they get bummed out, and uh, the market does worse during the first two years of that uh, new president. The in if an incumbent wins, he doesn't typically spend the first two years blaming the last guy for, and for creating all sorts of problems. And so the market tends to cruise higher a little bit easier during the first two years. In the third year, though, they the two patterns match up very closely and do pretty much the same thing. And in the fourth year, uh, it's the you, a first-term president tends to do better. So that's a, a slight, a little bit of difference. But remember, these are average patterns uh, made up of a lot of data. Your mileage may vary. It doesn't mean it has to work that way in the coming four years. <laughs> it's it's it, these are it's such a great way to start the start the discussion, Tom. And I, I have so many things I'd love to ask you about this. I just want to hit one thing, um, and then we're gonna and then we're gonna continue on. You know, on this slide we were talking about, you know, the COVID crash. It, it brings to mind when I was talking with Louisa Mata when oil prices just went you know vertical, right? A number of years ago, oil prices kind of went vertical. They settled back down. And if you cover up that part of the slide or that that part of the chart. The trend actually was pretty reasonable. There was just this, you know, big, huge, you know, life-changing interruption as the as the market spiked. Is that how you think of things like the COVID crash? You know, when you're relating it to a pattern, are there just one-time things that will kind of knock it off and then it settles back in, or how do you address that sort of thing when you're looking at the presidential cycle? That's a good question. And yes, sometimes you just have to put your thumb over parts of the chart. A uh, <laughs> good example was Eisenhower's heart attack. Knocked the market mm. down a little bit, and it came back. JFK's assassination knocked the market down, it came back. Those were exogenous events. And yes, news events can tip the market one way or the other. Um, and so those are, are not part of what is the average phenomena that go on in the political calendar and and how Congress and the and the administration behave. And so those don't really factor into what's going on in the average. And so you can get those anomalous events sometimes. And you just have to understand and accept that. It's like when you have a, a road map to navigate, uh, sometimes there's a road closure that's not published on the map. And, and so you just have to divert around that and then you get back on track again. I feel like if you're a fan of exogenous events, we, uh, we're, you're, you're probably pretty satisfied with 2020 with all the opportunities we have to deal with one-off events. I want to continue on with our next uh, guest participant, Bruce Frazier. Bruce, when you and I were talking about the presidential cycle, you related it to the 10-year cycle. And, and I think it's worth pointing out that the four-year presidential cycle is just one of many out there. Can you talk us through your process of, uh, of relating these two key cycles? Well, the 10-year uh, decennial pattern, so to speak, is uh, a general tendency of the decade, which is uh, uh, kind of a unique and interesting phenomenon. And I thought it would be interesting to talk about this relative to some prior, call them case studies or past presidential uh, cycles that uh, might be interesting to the current situation. And so you can see here looking uh, at this uh, tenure decennial, that there's a general tendency for the zero, one, and two years of the decade, and of course we're in the zero year now, to have uh, generally weakness. This is the weakest part of the uh, tenure decennial. And then into the two year, and this relates back to what Tom was saying about, uh, in some cases you have the presidential election year in the zero, and then uh, pre the president comes in and says, well, we've got bigger problems than we thought, and this is uh, the uh, weakness in the market is demonstrating that. And then a classic accumulation type structure often forms in the two or the three year, and you start this uh, uptrending market that takes us through the middle part of the decennial with 
the fifth year being the best, and then we get into the sixth and seventh. And Tom was just saying that this is the anniversary of the 87 crash. Well, right. the 87 crash occurred right uh, on target, on time, in that uh, decline that we can see right there. And then from that point, the eighth and the ninth year, not as strong as the middle part of the decade, but they uh, generally a good uptrend into the end of the decennial, and then you start over in the zero year. And I just have an example to show you, uh, which uh, here, and then we'll come back to it later on if we have time. Mm -hmm. This is the 50s. And so I'm not gonna talk about the 50s per se, but we just talked about Eisenhower's heart attack. Well, Eisenhower was president through uh, the majority of the 50s into uh, the 1960 election. And interestingly, there were four recessions over 11 years that goes back to uh, from 1949 up to 61. So this was a period when there was some real uh, economic uh, cyclicality that uh, affected the markets. But look at how well the 10-year decennial worked through this period. As a matter of fact, coming out of the uh, 40s, and the post-World uh, War II uh, period, you can see that the market had an upward bias to it, even in the uh, zero through the two years, and then really had the best and strongest part of the decade was the fourth and fifth years into a big reaccumulation or consolidation phase in, in years six and seven. And then the classic uh, eighth and ninth year rally, which took us into the end of the decade. So you can see that there's a tremendous family resemblance there. And in the seventh year, right there at the uh, third quarter, you can see this big decline that just persisted all the way down into the end of the year. So uh, then uh, from there, let's look at why this decennial might be relevant to the discussion that we're having today, which is to look at the three presidential elections, which occur on the beginning of the decennial in the first year. And that was uh, John F. Kennedy winning in 1960, and then uh, Ronald Reagan winning in 1980, and uh, Bush uh, winning in 2000. Well, what do these have in common? They have a few things in common, actually. And here we are in 2020. So is there something that about these three examples that inform uh, our current situation. Well, first of all, I'd like to point out, because I am a chartist, I'm a Wyckoffian, is that each one of these periods had weakness into the second year lows. And they had beautiful accumulation type structures that set up uh, important bull market runs after the second year. Very interesting. The other thing is, is that in each one of these cases, the incumbent party loses. So uh, John F. Kennedy beat the vice president, Richard Nixon, who was trying to extend the Eisenhower administration into a third term. In the case of 1980, uh, President Reagan defeats President Carter, who was a one-term president. So the incumbent party loses uh, in the 1980 example. And then in 2000, we have a contested election, which might relate somewhat to the 2020 period. There could be a contested election, or there's certainly talk about it, where uh, Bush uh, defeats Vice President Gore, who was trying to extend the uh, Democratic administration, President Clinton's uh, administration, into a third term. And so with that, we look ahead to 2020, and we can see here that we have a very close election. We have a president that's trying to uh, win or extend into a second term. And we have what could be a very tight election could go either way, and it could potentially be contested. And there are other things about all three of these examples that we can come back to later on. It's great, Bruce. And I, I, you know, just with both of you guys, I'm, I'm remembering how much the study of market history adds value. And especially with charting, right? If you want to learn 
about how these different elections are related. Again, there's so much to, to debate about the different conditions, but the charts really tell a fantastic story about how these are related. And I like, I like where we're going with the whole cyclicality of it. And there's a, there's a relationship that, uh, that makes sense to pay attention to. Having said that, Let's go, Jeff, first to you. Um, you know, uh, again, when, we, when you and I were talking about this and we, we talked as a, as a group, you started leaning into this idea of, you know, who wins and loses and how that might potentially change the cycle. So I'd love for you to start uh, going through uh, how you approach this, uh, this idea of the presidential cycle. Well, I mean, Tom and I have, have uh, a lot of agreement, a lot of similarities in the work we do. And I also do a lot with the decennial cycle. We carry the decennial cycle in the almanac and have for years. Been seeing it shifting a bit in recent years. It hasn't the decennial hasn't been quite as as true as it was in the 50s and stuff. So that that's something that that we're keeping an eye on. Um, and as you can see, both my uh, my colleagues here brought up the incumbentness and the winning and losing part. And I think that's where the the, the crux of the situation is: is having a change in philosophy and a change in uh, agenda and 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 policy initiatives which is what makes the first two years uh, generally weaker, um, you know, post-election year and, and, and midterm year, as, as we refer to them. Um, and you see a lot of those midterm year election, um, midterm election year lows, like we had in 18, a little bit later than, than normal, but we still had one there. So the chart that we put up there, and, and I like to compare uh, the current year to what's gone on in the past, and, you know, we mentioned the, we were talking about the 87 crash. And one of the things I look at, which is not on this chart here, but just to throw it out there, is things changed after the 87 crash. I mean, the market systemically was impacted with the collars and the circuit breakers. And that's one of the time frames where we start uh, um, a cycle. We'll, we'll compare going back to 49, which is the first full four year cycle since World War II. And 87 would be a big point in time that we'll look as, as to how these seasonal patterns have changed. Um, since we had the collars put in, uh, you know, with the New York Stock Exchange. So here I'm just looking at election years, and we have all election years in blue, uh, incumbent loss, party losses in uh, red, and in green, incumbent party wins. And then the black line is 2020, and I've got the scale for 2020 on the right side because of the magnitude and amplitude of the, of the move with the, the COVID crash. As I, and I do like that name, Tom. I'm going to steal that. That's a... Uh, an alliteration that's just, you know, thanks for tossing that up. But um, the trend of the current year does has tracked a bit closer to the red line incumbent party loss. However, we're seeing that that come back up. And if you look at that level uh, of the black line, it's about 10 percent, um, which is right kind of about uh, where we are, you know, um, where, where we're getting close to on the green line of the incumbent party win. So level puts us up incumbent party win lines. Uh, we're seeing some trend performance here with the market up in October. That's usually a good sign for the incumbent. Uh, September, looking you know back a, a month, more in line with an incumbent party loss. So uh, again, it highlights the the fence that everyone's sitting on in the electorate and the the precariousness of this election, how close it really is. Um, but tracking, you know, a little bit higher here would, would, would indicate to me that we, we might be seeing the incumbent win, uh, and therefore the market would probably finish a bit higher for the year. Though uh, I have something I call the uh, ding dong, the witch is dead effect, which is what happens after an unpopular president gets ousted. And you really don't know that they're that unpopular until they get ousted. Mm. And usually the market sells off, but then the rally is stronger after that. And that would be something that you might look at um, as a, you know, shorter term uh, trade here towards the, you know, after the election, if, if Trump loses and the market's down, might be a good opportunity for uh, a stronger year end rally from that level. Uh, whereas uh, if the market keeps going up, it's probably going to continue um, along those lines with, with an incumbent party win. The next slide, I compared um, a couple of different scenarios, a little more tabular look, just so people can see the numbers of the four main indices we track, the, you know, that's the NASDAQ composite and a Russell 2000 along with the S&P and Dow. Incumbent party wins, I threw in, started with 48, just to um, show that there was, uh, uh, you know, we had a little bit of a post-World War II sell-off there. Um, and the incumbent party losses at the bottom. You can see the gains 
are much stronger when incumbent parties uh, lose for the big the big caps. Uh, small caps do better and the tech stocks do better when incumbent parties win. But generally, overall, you got techs and small caps and NASDAQ tech stocks down at the bottom under all election years, uh, showing their real seasonal outperformance. And I, I think that some of the seasonality here um, in November, December with um, tech stocks and small caps are really turning around with, you know, sort of the holiday frenzy of buying stuff, both retail buying and institutional uh, stock buying and, and retail investor stock buying uh, generates, or, you know, uh, instigates and pushes that that small cap and tech rally that, um, you know, what used to be the January effect sort of starts a bit early uh, mm. um, and, and really pick, picks up the last couple of weeks of December. So if people are looking for an area to be in after this election, tech and small caps might be uh, a, a a better place than, than the large caps that have been sort of leading things for a while. Um, and then on the Republican Democratic side, if you want to just look at that real quickly, uh, you know, not a whole lot of difference. I, I see the small caps uh, doing better uh, under the Democrats. Um, big caps, not so not so strong with Democratic Party wins. That, that may be an ideological uh, thing where you get tax changes and, and different um, regulation uh, uh, you know, changes that will impact uh, the big cap stocks more than the small caps. And then we'll look ahead on the next slide to the next year. Uh, again, sticking with that incumbent party win and incumbent party loss. And I think this was uh, highlighted as well by by Tom and Bruce, um, especially Tom in the in the in the, the, the four year cycle slide where um, markets are generally weaker when you have new presidents coming in. They uh, take care of what I refer to as their un most unsavory uh, policy initiatives, change things up. Investors and companies don't know exactly what to expect. And that's why you see post-election years and midterm years a little bit weaker. And you get that strength in the third in the third year, what we call the pre-election year. So you can see the dotted line and come party losses um, generally weaker out of the blocks if we have a new presidency uh, and weak across the board. Only a couple of percent on average this is the S&P back to 49. Um, Incumbent party wins. Status quo, things stay the same. Nobody's got to readjust their their marketing strategy. Uh, even strong through the you know the sell in May period, the worst six months. But again, what we're seeing on a seasonal basis, and it's highlighted pretty well in this chart, is the worst four months, July through October, and especially August and September, the worst two months of the year. Um, in all three instances here, you're seeing that seasonal weakness when everybody takes off. And there's a lot of a, a lot less trading and volume and people present on the street or behind the screens with the prop desks. And then you get that that, you know, year end rally, which is strong. So a uh, good look at seasonals here, as well as what a post election year might look like with a, a new president versus a reelected president. So f thank you so much for that, Jeff. And can I just say for all three of you, we had a discussion last week and I asked you very kindly, let's not keep it, you know, let's, let's stay away from political debates. There's there's plenty of that out there. Let's focus it on the charts. And thank you, all three of you, for listening and, and doing such a great job of focusing on the evidence. I really appreciate it. Jeff, if we could stick with you. So you mm -hmm. you touched on this. I'd love for you to expand on this just a little bit. You talked about a number of times this seasonal pattern. I think it was one of your slides where, um, you know, where where it you clearly you can see the rally in November and December, which is sort of you know the sell in May and you know come back in November. This is sort of following the traditional pattern. So can you just expand a little bit about how you relate the four year cycle, the presidential cycle, to the seasonal cycle, which obviously your work with the with the uh, stock traders almanac is mm -hmm. you know something I've I've, I've followed on many of us for for so long. How do you relate those two, especially if they're in sort of disagreement at times? Um, I mean. <laughs> I'm a more of a seasonal guy. <laughs> the longer term <laughs> patterns, I, I think just because they're so long mm -hmm. are not necessarily as as uh, um, indicative in the short term. But we've also combined the two. We have a, a strategy in the Almanac that combines the four year and the seasonal cycle. So you basically have two trades every four years and mm -hmm. you're basically only trading in and out of the best and worst six months of the post election year and the midterm year. And you're just riding that third year all the way through you know, through the, the post-election year, um, you buy the midterm bottom, basically, and then you sell the uh, uh, post-election year um, spring, you know, the, the sell in May and the post-election year. And you combine those two. Uh, and it's a pretty simple strategy. 
Um, on top of this, you know, let's get technical for a second. I know these guys are technical people as well. We all are. Uh, you, we layer MACD on top of this, and you know, mm. we tip our hat to Jerry Appel, who I don't know if you guys know, just left us a little while, last year. Um, I'm in touch with his his son Marvin on occasion, who's a a mensch uh, in his own right. But combining, and this is of course the late Cy Harding's addition to our um, our work, which I quote him in the Almanac all the time when he in his writing of the Bear Book, where he combined our best six month switching strategy with with Appel's MACD to make the, I think he dubbed it the greatest mechanical system ever. And it works, doesn't work 100% of the time, nothing does. But if you look for a little technical trigger using MACD, which is meant to confirm a buy or sell or an entry or an exit, not in and of itself, whether it's a fundamental reason to buy a stock or another technical reason to get in and out of a trade, or in my case, a lot of it's seasonal, we wait for the MACD to trigger to give us a crossover in um, October, after October 1st for a buy, and after April 1st for a sell on um, Dow and S&P, and, and after June 1st, which NASDAQ has the best eight months uh, for NASDAQ and Russell. And it's very impactful. And we use the 817.9, which is a faster one on the on the bottom, you know, on the buy signal, and the old school 1226.9 on the on the sell. Tops are more of a process. They take a little more time. And bottoms are generally a more of an event. So we do combine a little bit of the the the, the four-year cycle and the seasonal pattern, but um, I do have a little more. I do lean a little more heavily just towards the seasonals on the yeah on the on the shorter term side of it. So that's really really helpful, Jeff Bruce. It it brings to mind when I think of you, I think of the Wyckoff, which you know for me just feels like a beautifully structured approach to analyzing the market. I'd, I'd love for you to speak to how you relate something like cycles. You're talking about things like the four-year, even the ten-year cycle. How do you relate that to price and pattern and time, which is really the, the function of, or the, the focus of Wyckoffian analysis. How do you relate those? Well, they're very complementary. And of course, in the case of uh, uh, chart analysis or tape reading, as uh, Wyckoff called it, there is the uh, analysis of accumulation or distribution of the price chart with volume or a point and figure chart that demonstrates that a stock or the market is poised and ready to begin an important markup or markdown. Mm -hmm. And when you have this cyclical work, the cycle work, saying that this is the time and the place that this should happen, it uh, it's a great confirmation. But the final determination is when you see the completion of that accumulation structure and it's saying, OK, this is the place where we're ready to go from being in accumulation to starting a markup. And you can sort of see that uh, over here in this chart that we're looking at, which is the uh, in the March, April period. There's a beautiful accumulation structure there that you could see around the lows. And then the markup begins and it just goes for a substantial period of time. And there was some great point and figure work that uh, indicated the extent to which that rally should go. So mm -hmm. beautiful uh, long-term trend up into the September high. I love how you both have driven home. I know on, on my show, we talk a lot about price versus other, you know, and focusing on price versus other things, cycle, sentiment, breadth. And you guys are articulating really well the, the relationship between these cycles, but then price and, and how to focus on that. Um, Tom, if I could bring you back into the to the discussion, our, our probably mutual friend, Walter Deemer, who's a, a mentor of mine early on and continues to be, you know, he actually, when I told him we were going to do this special, he asked me if I would ask you all about um, the presidential cycle versus the four-year cycle. Is calling it the presidential cycle a, a you know, a shorthand for referring to something that also happens to be on a four-year routine? Or is this, you know, is this just a four-year cycle that occurs naturally that we're able to identify? Or is there something specific to the presidential, you know, the election season that would cause you to think there's less correlation and, and also causality to that? How would you answer that question? Uh, I would put on my engineer's hat and answer it in physics terms. Okay. Uh, if you have something that oscillates, um, any, any mechanical system is going to have a natural frequency of vibration. So mm -hmm. if you pluck a violin string, you're going to get a certain note because it vibrates at exactly that frequency. If you are driving your car down the road, you may feel uh, some bumpiness uh, from the road. That's not necessarily the natural frequency of your, your car. It's an induced um, 
cyclical oscillation based on the bumpiness of the way that the road was constructed. However, if you rev your engine up to exactly the right frequency where you get the, the, uh, the, the natural frequency of the motor, a bit more vibration coming out of the engine at just that RPM. So in, in, in market terms, we all know that there are natural cycles in the market, hmm. uh, but there are also induced cycles. And the four-year calendar of our presidential and congressional elections is what I would characterize as an induced cycle. It's it's <laughs> being caused by the the intersection of the political forces and the and the market forces uh, interacting with each other and going to work on each other. If we had a six year presidential election cycle like Mexico does, I suspect, uh, but I can't prove it, that we would see a different behavior in the in the interrelationship of prices and time. Uh, but we've been we've had this four year period since about 1789. So uh, it's, it's it's a pretty well established uh, um, uh, pro protocol. And I don't think that uh, Congress is going to entertain ideas to change that. That's a, that's a great that's a great point. Um, you know, uh, I totally agree. Yeah, right, right, right. Jeff, when, when I'm the quadrennial quadrille. I, and there's one more point also, and, and Jeff's father, Yale Hirsch, mentioned this in his book, uh, Don't Sell, Sell Stocks on Monday. Um, he talked about how the presidential cycle behavior has changed with the 20th Amendment to the Constitution, which got uh, enacted in 1933. Which moved the inauguration day from March 4th to January 20th, right? That's right. And it also got rid of a 13-month lame duck Congress. So it changed the political calendar in a huge way before that amendment to the Constitution went into effect, it, it was very normal that in the third year of a presidential term, you'd have a big bear market. So like the, the panics of 1903 and 1907, those were third years. And um, now we're used to having seeing the third year be a, generally an up year. And so the changing the, the dynamics of how the political calendar works do mm. does have a demonstrable effect on how the stock market behaves in response. So you bring up you bring up some great points about the, the consistency of these cycles, right? Because uh, you know, and again, when we're looking at them, we see this traditional pattern. There's this, I, I guess, this natural assumption that that pattern is going to continue perpetually, right? That the, this will continue to be this pattern. How do you guys deal with you know consistency issues or even potentially inconsistency if you know if the world if the world changes? You track it and you change your strategy with it if, the, if it happens over a long enough period of time. I mean, our seasonal calendar, we use a 21-year you know, uh, uh, window for the shortest period of time where I'll, I'll make an adjustment. And we compare, as I was saying earlier, 21 years to like since 87 or since 88 or even 71 when NASDAQ began to since 49. And we'll, we'll overlay them and look at where the you know um, sort of correlation is between the three or four different time frames. As opposed to just the recency of impact and the, or the you know, ant, you know, antiquated impact. You can also understand, David, that uh, the presidential cycle re reflects an average tendency, and mm. no market period is ever going to be exactly like the average. Some are going to be better or worse. Some other, sometimes the market's going to go wandering on its own, off on its own, as we saw in March with the COVID crash. That was definitely not part of the average behavior of the stock market based on the past. It was caused by a, an, an exogenous news event. And those are going to happen. And you, so you can know what the roadmap is supposed to look like, but then you got to trade what's actually happening. And, and that's a tough thing to do to, to reconcile. I'm, I'm, I have a plan. I'm trying to trade the plan. I'm trying to follow my roadmap and, and get where I'm supposed to go. But then I'm seeing what's happening. So it, that's what the gray matter between the ears is for, is to try to make sense out of, out of those two conflicting signals. And, you know, you, you make some great points that th there are plenty of exogenous events this year, especially that feel like we've, we've never or, or certainly not since any of us have been following the markets have seen exactly. But we have seen exogenous defense events before, different ones and with different scenarios. But we can see what's happened historically, you know, when when one off things sort of happen. Bruce, I'd love for you to answer, um, you know, one of the people I, I mentioned we were going to do a, an event on this. They asked about the self-fulfilling prophecy of this, right? How much of what we're talking about with this traditional pattern, and, and whether it's the four-year cycle, the seasonal patterns, even the longer-term cycles, how much of that is a, you know, could be a self-fulfilling prophecy? We just assume that the market's going to rally. We all sort of put our bets on the table, and magically it, it does what we expect. Versus, is this, you know, is, is it less so? How, how would you answer that? Well, we, 
in sort of the Wyckoffian world, we look at the markets from the perspective of the large operators. Mm. And these are the very large interests that have the ability to be able to significantly move prices with their campaigns of buying and selling. And it's not just one person or one institution, but there's a number of institutions that are very good at what they do that tend to move together and they move in such a way that they can drive prices up and down through their activities. And this is what we're looking for in the footprint of stock prices. And so, uh, you know, we sort of have the view that it's the motives of the large interests that really determine the trend extent and duration of moves. And that that's what we should be focusing on in price activity and in volume activity. And so that's, um, I think, more important. I don't necessarily believe the notion of, uh, uh, you know, a self-fulfilling prophecy of uh, tr trends happen because of, uh, um, you know, a certain cycle being in force. As a matter of fact, the example of the three uh, presidents that uh, we had talked about, each one of those, and I think this is a really important th point, I'll make it very briefly, and that is in 1960, uh, John F. Kennedy, uh, subsequently not in his, uh, but as a, as a product of his election, he did something very interesting. He started to cut uh, income taxes. And so uh, he also cut the corporate tax rate and that's the kind of a policy decision that gets made that can have an effect on a decade of prices. And so uh, John F. Kennedy, uh, in 1963, they uh, got this passed, 64, post his uh, death, it was uh, enacted, but it had a huge effect on the 60s <laughs> and uh, the trend of prices because so much of what happens in the stock market is a function of how capital is treated. And if capital is treated well, which means the tax rates are efficient, then uh, prices are going to tend to reflect that. Well, what happened in this after Kennedy was <clears throat> you had four successive presidents that all raised taxes or Congress raised taxes on their watch. The 70s was just one big hot mess. <laughs> And uh, the 80s, Reagan, who gave all due credit to Kennedy, cut taxes significantly. Kennedy, the top tax rate was 91 percent, and he cut taxes, eh, you know, 20 to 30 percent for uh, for individuals and for corporations, about eight to 10 percent. But Reagan also had a significant effect on uh, marginal tax rates. That has an impact on what investments do well and which investments don't do well. And so this is a trend, the trend of presidents raising and lowering taxes as a product of their, uh, uh, their strategy uh, does have a huge impact on stock prices. You know, your comment right at the beginning reminded me of our friend, the late uh, Hank Pruden, talking about the composite man. So if people want to know more about that, uh, you know, that, that composite operator, that's a really good place to uh, to start Hank's work. Um, we're, folks, we're almost out of time, which is a bummer, because I would love to keep talking about this for, for so much longer. But I would love to, to give each of you just a, a minute or two to talk about, given everything we've gone through, given where we're at in the cycle, the traditional seasonal patterns of, of most likely strength going into your end, and the uncertainty of the uh, of the elections, where would you place your bets? If you have new money to put to work today, where would you be looking, uh, given everything we've talked about? Tom, could we start with you? How would you how would you think of that? Uh, first, if you could pull up Jeff's ch chart of uh, if the incumbent wins or if the uh, challenger wins. Yep. Uh, there's there's a there's one point in that chart I want to I want to highlight just ahead of us. Um, there's a dip in late October, and it sh and it shows up. Either way, if the incumbent party <laughs> loses or if the incumbent party wins, you get that dip in late October, which is just fascinating. So I'm expecting that we are going to have a little swoop up right now this week and then a dip at, down toward the end of the month and then a swoop up toward the election. Um, and then I, I'm ex excited about the prospects, irrespective of the election. I'm excited about the stock market's prospects between now and next April based on long-term 
psychoanalysis and, and leading indication work that we do that, I, that is not part of this discussion. Uh, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm gonna be a buyer of the market uh, at that late October dip. Got it. So tactically, a bit of a pullback going into uh, the latter part of the month and then, and then strength going into year end. So certainly seems uh, offense over defense, I would guess. Um, Bruce, how would you answer that question? Given all we've talked about, how would you be positioned if you had new money to put to work today? Well, there's two parts of this uh, post-election scenario that are, I think, at work. And one of them is the, um, the who wins the presidency. The other part of it is who controls Congress mm -hmm. and whether there's a split Congress or whether the all you know, uh, three houses are uh, controlled by the same party. So uh, to me, the question is what assets to emphasize and uh, I'm of the mind that if we uh, continue on with this uh, lo lowering, with the incumbent wins and we have a lowering of tax rates, it's generally going to be a positive for uh, blue chip, uh, blue chip stop stocks, the real <laughs> economy, uh, infrastructure uh, rebuilding and so on. And I think it's gonna have an effect on how uh, funds rotate back into the real economy, and uh, if the um, if it's if it's a policy where taxes are going to generally go up, then I think you're going to want to emphasize other assets. It's a great take, you know. And uh, Larry Berman was on my show uh, a number of months ago and talked about infrastructure. His point was, regardless of who wins, the investment in infrastructure seems relatively likely. So that was one area he was uh, thinking. I sort of uh, uh, relates to what you just said there, uh, Jeff Hirsch. How would you answer that question? I know you're, um, you know, part of your role as being a strategist at probabilities funds. When you're thinking from a money management perspective, how do you approach this for the next couple months? Well, I mean, there's a couple of things I wanted to touch on also, but, uh, you know, the, the, the um, we approach it from a seasonal standpoint. We'll be looking for that MACD buy signal from our, mm -hmm. you know, assets under management, switching into a much more bullish uh, position. We have a scheduled calendar based upon the seasonals, and if we get that MACD trigger, we increase leverage. Um, in our newsletter side of things, we'll be looking for a basket of, uh, stocks that are fundamentally screened, technically sound to get into right around that point that Tom pointed out of the chart. And thank you very much for that. Um, and that's what we'll be, we'll be looking to enter the market. Uh, there's some sector trades that, that we have with different ETFs. Uh, but again, switching into, you know, the main indices, whether it's through ETFs or otherwise, you know, as I call them, the diamond spiders and cubes the, and the IWM is a good, good time to look for an entry point right there with a technical trigger. Um, and, you know, looking out to next year, I, I think it's important, as Bruce is bringing it up, to, to be leery of the type of tax treatment that's out there. And I, mm. I happen to agree that, you know, blue chips are probably going to do better uh, from some of the research we showed that um, if, if the incumbent stays in, whereas smaller caps and other assets might be a place to consider if we have uh, a different presidency. Um, I think biotech is a sector to be looking into. Uh, for many years up to now, and I don't mean just the fly-by-night biotechs, the ones that um, are producing things and kicking off, you know, trackable numbers on 10 Qs and 10 Ks, uh, the Regenerons is sort of the, of, of the world and, and those kinds of stocks we've been hearing about. Um, and there's energy tech uh, and regular tech are, are some of the main industries going forward, but um, you got to have a place in your portfolio for some of the, the stodgier, more um, income producing, uh, um, you know, sectors, utilities and dividend paying stocks and that sort of thing as well. But end of October, great time to buy stocks, especially techs and small caps. It's a great take. Gentlemen, this has been so much fun. I want to thank each of you for giving us some time. And, and you're, you know, I'm, I'm so happy that each of you had an independent look, but all a lot of great similarities and uh, and, and comparisons between your three uh, takes on the presidential cycle. Um, so Jeff Hirsch, Bruce Frazier, Tom McClellan, thank you guys so much each for joining us uh, on the show for, uh, for, for each of them. Tom, the editor of the McClellan Market Report. Bruce, professor and white coffee and wizard, host of uh, Power Charting on Stock Charts TV, and Jeff Hirsch, editor-in-chief of the Stock Traders Almanac, chief market strategist at the Probabilities Fund. 
Um, for everyone, regardless of what you think of the presidential cycle and all the charts we've shown, please make sure you go out and vote right about now. Uh, for everyone here at Stock Charts TV, I want to thank you so much for joining us. Check out all of our specials on our YouTube channel. Have a great night. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.